Namaste. So chapter six, the text is a little bit confusing and hard to parse. Uh, I don't know whether it's the fault of the translation or the text is just obscure. You know, it's possible. But anyway, uh, to tease out the meaning of the six koshas is not exactly straightforward. <laughs> and you know, a lot of these things, concepts of the spiritual world and so on, are very fuzzy. So they kind of overlap, <laughs> merge into one another. This doesn't appear to be like sharp boundaries between one kosha and another. Now, kosha can mean a sheath or a body. And we've explored this concept before in our uh, videos on the five koshas of the human being. So the human being has koshas and Shakti also has koshas. Huh? As above, so below. The difference is she has six and we only have five. The Anna Kosha or food body, which means the gross material body. The Prana Kosha, which means the energy body, the chakras and so on. Nadis and all of that. Kundalini. Huh? And then there's the Mana Kosha, the mind. The Vijnana Kosha, the intelligence. And finally, the Ananda Kosha, which is pure consciousness. But in the case of Shakti, it's a little bit different. Let's take a look at the chart. The Shakti Kosha is the deities, the Chaturvyuha of Vasudev, Sankarshan, Pradyumna, and Aniruddha. Now then, she goes on to say that Aniruddha is the eyehood of the other deities, and his consort is named Rati. Now, Rati has interesting meanings. Uh, it can mean rest, or it can mean pleasure, like lovemaking, the pleasures of the bed, uh, erotic joy, and so on like that. So, see, it's not that, there's, that the spiritual world is sexless. That's a stupid idea. <laughs> I don't know where it comes from, but it's wrong. No, the spiritual world is full of all kinds of enjoyment. And Rati in Sanskrit is a generic name for enjoyment in general. So then, you know, why? Uh, I mean, of course, it's because of austerity. And it's very good for concentration of the mind not to have a complicated life full of all kinds of relationships, uh, but to be a solitary or even wandering monk type of person. And, well, I'll get to the significance of that in a minute. Then there's the Prasuti Kosha, which is the three goddesses, Mahalakshmi, Mahakali, and Saraswati, or Mahavidya. Then there's Prakriti Kosha, the three material gunas, goodness, passion, and ignorance. Then there's the Brahmanda Kosha, the cosmic egg, Hiranyagarbha. And finally, the Jiva Deha, the individual living beings. Now, Jiva means one who is born. And certainly we see in this world that every kind of living creature is born, either directly or through an egg or some other means. So the creatures that are born are mortal. Like it says in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, one who is born will surely die, and one who is dead will surely be born again. So this is samsara, the wheel of birth and death. And this goes on and on and on. 
<laughs> up and down through the different species and different planets and lokas and so on, until one reaches self-realization. And Shakti describes this uh, at the end of her description of the six koshas in chapter six. She says that once a person reaches satyaloka, now satyaloka is realization of pure consciousness, that I am nothing but consciousness. And these other sheaths, other koshas of the human body, the vijnana kosha, the mano kosha, the mano maya kosha, huh? Uh, not maya, but maya. Not long A's, but short A's. So the vijnana maya kosha is the intelligence, the mano maya kosha. Maya in this case means made of, not illusion, although they are illusory. <laughs> it's funny. Sanskrit has different length of vowels, short and long. And the long is held twice as long as the short. A, A, E, E, U, U, Ri, Ri. Okay, those are the, the short and long vowels. And then there's the only long vowels. O, I, A, Ao. See? And these are all long. And it changes the meaning. So that's why we have the little macron, the little line over the A, to signify a long vowel. So these aren't maya, well, they're maya. So after the manomaya kosha, there's the uh, pranamaya kosha and the anamaya kosha, the food body, the body made of food. Huh? You are what you eat. <laughs> so um, we should keep vegetarian diet like that. And it's not that sex is wrong, bad, horrible, sinful, etc. But even the tantrikas for whom sex is a sacrament practice moderation in sex. They have a sexual ritual called maituna, but that is performed only during certain phases of the moon. And I, not phases is the wrong word, <laughs> nakshatras uh, of the moon and the days of the moon and so on. So this is great science. And the science has been largely lost due to popularizing these sacred teachings and making them into business and so forth. And we know one guy who for many years claimed to be teaching Tantra, but actually he was, a, <laughs> he was a big drug dealer and he was using his Tantra classes as a front to shield his illegal activities. <laughs> Rascal. So anyway, these sheaths in the human are more or less immortal except for the anamaya kosha, the food body. That's the gross body. And of course, that falls off after it's worn out <laughs> and you get another one. So of course, this whole process is fraught with suffering. And most acute suffering is the mental suffering of having to end one life and begin another. So all of this is going on only in the most external shell or kosha, sheath of Shakti. Once one attains Satyaloka, which means realization of being as pure consciousness, once one has that realization, then he's not born again in a gross body. All the other subtle bodies, the uh, Pranamaya kosha, Manumaya kosha, Vijnanamaya kosha, those also then fall off. And one becomes pure consciousness. But does that mean he's no longer an individual or just merges into the light or whatever? No. No. Because Shakti says clearly that once he reaches Satyaloka, he continues to ascend through 
the koshas. See, so what does that mean? That means he reaches the level of the cosmic egg, Hiranyagarbha. That would be like Brahma Loka, because Brahma is the chief of that, or actually the creator of that cosmic egg. And then he reaches the Prakriti, Prakriti Kosha, and he becomes on the level of the three gunas. And just after that is the Prasuti Kosha with the three goddesses who embody those gunas. So he becomes a direct devotee of those goddesses. And then he can rise even higher. He can go to the Maya Kosha, huh? long A's this time, Maya Kosha, uh, which is the essence of illusion. See, complete enjoyment. There's no suffering. Everything is pleasurable. Everything is nice. Uh, and then beyond that, to the Shakti Kosha, which are the four deities, Vasudev, Pradyumna, Shankarshan, Aniruddha. You see, this is the highest level. And then from there, he goes to the spiritual world. But he has to cross the subtle creation, the, what Shakti calls the pure creation. Lakshmi makes the pure creation before the gross creation, the impure creation. And in that, there is no suffering, there is no death. Huh? No one is born, therefore no one dies in those worlds. What does that mean, no one is born? It means that people simply appear there when their consciousness has reached the proper level of development. They just appear. There's no process of birth. So there's no death either. People just disappear when they go on to the next higher level. And see, and in the meantime, time is conspicuous by its absence, as my Adi Guru would say. In other words, there's no old age, no sickness, no death, no misfortune, no suffering. Everything is beautiful. Everyone is beautiful. Everyone is wise, self-realized, full of wisdom and knowledge, kind, merciful. Everything is pure and clean. Huh? There's no pollution, no war, no arguments, no nothing. Everybody agrees because everyone is self-realized. They know the absolute truth. So, you see, this is so much beyond this, this narrow, dark world that sometimes is called the Veil of Tears, huh? the Valley of Suffering, that we are stuck in now because of karma, because the jivas are subject to the reactions of their previous activities. And our previous activities haven't been so nice. Huh? And really, the thing that keeps us in this world is harming or hurting others. So the very first vow, the very first real tangible step on the spiritual path is to take a vow of ahimsa, nonviolence to not inflict suffering on any other living entity. Now, sometimes suffering comes when we don't want it, but we can head this off too by performing austerities. Austerity means voluntary suffering, voluntarily taking trouble for the purpose of self-realization. And this is actually the, the motivating force on the spiritual path. Uh, taking vegetarian diet, for example, or taking a vow to take so many rounds or so many repetitions of a mantra, the mantra of one's Ishta Devata, you see? And one in, in the, the end will go to that deity, whatever deity you pick as your Ishta Devata, you will go to that deity wherever he or she is in whatever world he or she exists. This is why 
We recommend the highest mantras, like Shodashi mantra, uh, or Siddhi mantra at least, or any of the Devi mantras, of which there are many, many. Uh, if you followed our series a long time ago <laughs> on the Srimad Devi Bhagavatam, this contains many mantras according to different forms of the goddess. Just pick the one you like and recite it day and night. Uh -huh. And this will ultimately bring you to the highest realizations of enlightenment. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum.